All rise. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The Supreme Court of Florida is now in session. Let all who have cause to plead draw near, give attention, you will be heard. God save these United States, the great state of Florida, and this honorable court. Ladies and gentlemen, the Florida Supreme Court, please be seated. Good morning and welcome to the Florida Supreme Court. Our first case today is number 2022-1042, Verker versus Powell. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, good morning. I'm Dwayne Robinson, here on behalf of petitioner Kevin Vereker. This lawsuit is about a village attorney who filed a lawsuit against a citizen for engaging in political speech that is at the very heart of the First Amendment, speech related to the public obligations and duties of the village attorney. This is a textbook slap suit that the legislature clearly and unambiguously prohibited in Florida Statutes 768-295. We're asking this court to rule here today that there is irreparable harm when a trial court permits the continuation of a slap suit as a matter of law, when that slap suit is contrary to the statute as well as well-settled constitutional privileges. There's two reasons that emanate from the text to support this conclusion. One, when a trial court denies an interlocutor strike that, excuse me, when, a, when an appellate court denies immediate review of this lawsuit, it denies a right that we were given under subsection four of the statute, and that's the expeditious resolution of a slap claim. Two, the legislature told us in subsection one of the statute that these slap suits infringe on First Amendment rights. The Supreme Court has made it very clear that when you have an infringement of First Amendment rights, it infringes on our speech, and more importantly, even for a minimal period of time, it causes an irreparable injury. I think it's talk, a, go ahead. Can we talk a little bit about the statute? Um, so I know you said that it gives the right for sort of this um, expedited review. How would you define that um, as, would you, would you define that as a substantive right? Because it really seems to be more of a procedural um, procedural issue. It gives a lot of procedures. Um, it uses a lot of lofty language. I will give you that. But the the right it grants is very narrow. It's it's essentially procedural um, and attorney's fees. So how would you define this in a more substantive way? Sure. We, we define this as a substantive right. It's not merely a procedural right, and here's why. We have to turn to the text of the statute, which creates a prohibition, a prohibition on this particular type of suit. And it does that in a number of ways. If we start first with the title, it says slap suits are prohibited. That is a substantive right that did not exist before the enactment of this statute. And then you discuss lofty language. I disagree that it's lofty. I think I would define it more as encompassing the First Amendment values that the legislature sought to protect by adding this extra protection in the statute to prohibit suits that were already barred as a matter of constitutional law from being litigated in Florida courts. If you look, for instance, in subsection one, the statute says, quote, it is the intent of the legislature that such lawsuits be expeditiously disposed of by the courts. Courts as in plural. That's in contradistinction to the fourth subsection of that statute when the, when the legislature discusses motions to dismiss, motions to summary judgment, it refers to court in the singular. You do not have expeditious resolution of a lawsuit until parties are entitled to their appeal as a right to have it resolved by an appellate court. But isn't part of the context here, at least in some cases, there are gonna be disputed issues of fact that will determine whether or not is it is a slap suit. Uh, and so it's never going to be possible to, to resolve these, uh, or it's not always going to be possible to resolve these cases short of a trial. 
where those, those facts are, are decided. Uh, isn't that correct? That is absolutely correct, Justice Kennedy. But as this court held in the Tucker case, we have that in, in qualified immunity as well. There are some questions of qualified immunity that cannot be answered short of a trial. But we don't deny everyone the right to interlocutory review in those instances. Well, and, and qualified immunity has the burden, burden shifting aspect, which I think your friends on the other side have pointed out is absent from this statute. Um, so structurally, why do you think this is similar to qualified immunity? Not just labels. I know it says pro prohibited. Yes. But what structurally makes it equivalent to qualified immunity in your view? Sure. Justice Sasso, so if we look at the statute and what it seeks to do, it, it merely addresses First Amendment speech that's already protected by the First Amendment. So that means you're, you're free from liability. You're free from prior restraints, as a matter of fact. So we have already an immunity from liability. What the legislature does is it adds on top, it's on top of that a prophylactic, a, a freedom from the actual suit itself. And so that's why we, we would argue that it is akin to qualified immunity, because it has that same aspect, immunity from suit as well as immunity from liability. And we see that, by the way, in the text of the statute. If we turn to subsection 4, it says that defendants have a right to an expeditious resolution of a slap claim. It doesn't say expeditious resolution of a slap motion. That language is noticeably absent from the but, statute. But the right that you have, to the extent we want to call it a right, is not to be subjected to a suit that lacks merit. And so, I mean, it's kind of begging the question, as Justice Kennedy was saying, to just sort of label this as sort of by, just because you say that it's a slap suit, that somehow it implicates all these things. I mean, it's a, it's an actually, it's a pretty weird statute in that way. As Justice Sasso was alluding to, all these other states that, you know, your colleagues on the other side went through, they add these procedural traps to it and everything that, you know, change it from a normal lawsuit. But this is, you know, it basically just says you can't file a lawsuit that, you know, that, that's, you know, that, that where you're the losing side on the merits. But how does that really change anything other than maybe putting an obligation on the trial court if there is a motion filed to put it at the top of the, of the pile rather than getting to it in the normal course of things? We don't presume that the legislature does needless acts. The legislature was seeking to accomplish something by enacting this statute. And what this statute says, it's not really any suit that's meritless. The legislature is addressing speech, speech that's protected, that we all know the First Amendment provides a right to be free from liability. But we don't really know if that's happening here until the litigation has played itself out. Not necessarily. So but, there, there but may be. Doesn't the, doesn't the legislature accomplish something through the provision of attorney's fees? Which maybe in some cases they, it would be available uh, anyway, but not always. You would, I mean, you would, you would. Uh, I'm sure you uh, have an interest in the attorney's fees and, and think that's a significant and meaningful uh, provision of the law. Well, what I would say to that, Justice Kennedy, is the legislature did not think attorney's fees would be the meaningful um, remedy because it granted a prohibition. And if we look at the text of the statute, you would have to go through the title where it talks about prohibition, subsection one. Subsection 2. I'm glad you brought up subsection 2 because okay. the title is, you're right, uh, a good feather in your cap. But I struggle to find operative words of prohibition here. Take, for example, <clears throat> the statute says, quote, free speech in connection with public issues, unquote, means any written or oral statement that is protected under applicable law and is made before a governmental entity in connection with an issue under consideration or review by a governmental entity. What was the issue under consideration or review by a governmental entity that was the subject of the speech at issue in this case? None. You have to keep reading the rest of the sub subsection okay. where it refers to the types of First Amendment conduct that the legislature is... Or is made in connection with a play, movie, television program, radio broadcast, audiovisual work, book, magazine article, musical work, news report, or other similar work? Mr. Vericker's blog is, an, is a magazine. It's an online magazine article. And if not, under a canon of construction, the phrase other similar work can include things of the same type and manner as the preceding items in that list. So you think this does the work of essentially saying anyone, anytime anyone says anything in any form of publication or on a blog, online, on a tweet, 
then it is free speech in connection with public issues? No, it, I, I'm not saying that at all, Justice Curiel. But what I'm saying is the speech that's at issue here, a magazine article where the author used traditional journalistic sources, public records, where he interviewed sources, where he made corrections, yes, that is within the plain text of the statute. To go back to Justice Kennedy's question about the fees, so then let's look at the statute. We have a clear prohibition in the title. We have subsection one that talks about the intent to, to prohibit these lawsuits. We have subsection two that Justice Coriel just mentioned. We then go to subsection three that has another prohibition language. We then get to subsection four, and at the very tail end of that subsection, we have language about a, a, attorney's fees, a very modest attorney's attorney's fees provision. Just, I guess what I'm getting at is, it seems to me that if the legislature really wanted to work a prohibition here, it could have just said the circuit courts will be without jurisdiction to hear a case in which this allegation is made. Well, what's your answer to the fact that that's not what we have? This seems instead to be, to use the language that Justice Grosshands was saying, sort of lofty, precatory. Um, why, why would the legislature choose this way of making something prohibited when it could have just divested the court of jurisdiction. It, but again, I think you're also missing the title. The title said, and I'm going to quote, strategic lawsuits against public I agree. participation. That's, that's, your, that's your best argument, but that's, that's, a, that's a little bit of legislative wrapping on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the present. And I'm opening the box, and there ain't much inside. Oh, I disagree with that tremendously, Justice Curry, and here's why. If we look at subsection 1, it talks about the fact that the legislature viewed that it needs to prohibit slap suits to protect constitutional rights. So now we have another example, another clue from the text that shows the legislature was seeking to prohibit this type of lawsuit. Then we go to subsection 3, where it expressly says that no person shall cause a lawsuit or a claim of this nature to be filed. That's very similar to the language at issue in Citizens v. San Perdido at section 627.351.6S1, the operative language that's in there. But even if you don't agree with us fully on the, the textual immunity here, there's also the First Amendment rights that grants Mr. Vericker and there, others like him the right to interlocutory review. The legislature has made the determination in this statute that slap suits infringe constitutional rights, but not all slap suits might Can be. I ask a question about the uh, the statute, sort of where it plays in the process of trial. Would you agree that this is distinctly a pretrial issue? It, so, for instance, once mm -hmm. you file your motion, you lose. Does this statute do any more work of protecting you in the lawsuit? Well, naturally, if you're if you're forced to tr go to trial, in some instances, I, I agree with uh, Justice Kennedy that there will be cases where. There'll be factual questions that have to be resolved, such as whether someone's a public figure. Here, that's not in dispute. But I think you're generally correct that the legislature's intent here was to stop these cases in their tracks. And so once you're at the trial stage, except for attorney's fees, there's really not much force thereafter. But to just if I can close the loop on Justice Kennedy's question about the attorney's fees, just keep in mind the attorney's fees are at the very tail end of the statute in subsection 4. The guts of the statute is not attorney's fees. It's almost the tail wagging the dog to conclude that the legislature went through all of these steps just to have a modest attorney's fees provision. Do you agree with um, the idea that if you lost the motion and you went to trial, that you would not be able to claim any attorney's fees under the statute or any of the cost um, associated with the lawsuit? I don't think I necessarily agree with that, Justice Grosjean. It, it hasn't come up in, in the briefing, but, but here's why. When you have a true uh, lawsuit where there are disputed, uh, disputed issues of fact that have to be resolved at the trial level, I don't think that that would deny the other rights under the statute, such as attorney's fees, simply because I couldn't get my a right to immediate and expeditious review. What this court said as early as last year in Carmody, which is, which is very important to this analysis, this court has allowed amendments to the rules of procedure, which is another alternative option we asked for, where there were substantive rights granted under statute, and this court was the only mechanism to protect those rights. Here we're dealing with fundamental First Amendment freedoms that the legislature passed multiple times in multiple different areas, sometimes unanimously, and other times with just one dissenting vote. But, um, uh, maybe I misunderstood you, but what just 
you, did you not recognize that, that or are you not recognizing that this is a prevailing party attorney's fee provision? I agree it is. Okay. I agree. So and, if you lose, you don't get attorney's fees. It's actually the opposite. If I lose on my SOP claim, the other side will likely get attorney's fees. But, but honestly, that is the wisdom of the statute. And I think that's why we have not seen a proliferation of so, SOP. I mean, isn't that kind of the point, though? On it, like, the statute does work. It, it can be a deterring statute without creating a right to interlocutory review, right? I mean, you have a, a strongly worded statute. You also have this motive kind of component to it that might need to work its way out through a trial. Um, but the legislature in prohibiting can also prescribe remedies for violations of their policy decision. And so I'm just wondering why the attorney's fees, which I, does, I do think does more work than 57105. I don't think we can say, oh, well, it's, it's of no matter because 57105 does the same thing. It obviously does more work than that. So why is it not a legislative decision here to say we prohibit it and we want to deter them and in our view, the proper remedy is attorney's fees. Because the legislature has made a different choice. The legislature could have said, you get attorney's fees, and that's all the deterrent we think is needed to stop these suits in their tracks. The legislature said repeatedly, over and over, these suits are prohibited. It's our intent that these, that these suits be prohibited because they infringe constitutional rights. No cause of action shall be, shall be filed where the suit has no merit. So I think that's, that's the answer to that question, Justice Asso. And there's also the First Amendment interest that provides. I just, I want to follow up. I just want to make sure I understand. Sure. So the attorney's fees says, the court shall award the prevailing party reasonable attorney's fees and costs incurred in connection with a claim that an action was filed in violation of this section. So you've, you filed your summary judgment, you've lost. Let's say you don't have a right to appeal. You go to trial, you win. But you can't claim this, like you're not arguing this to a jury, correct? This is just for pretrial purposes. How would you get fees under this statute for the rest of the claim when that was denied? It would be under the traditional rules of civil procedure, which in, within 30 days of any judgment, you would file a motion and say, I prevailed at trial on, on this issue. I proved that, that this claim was without, was without merit. And I would explain to the court that this is a slap suit. And to put a, a pin on a point I was trying to make earlier, the legislature did not define slap suit to be any claim anyone raises under the First Amendment. It, it's a very limited scope. And Justice Coryell pointed to Section 2 way and, and I think, too, by having a prevailing party fee that goes both ways, that's part of the reason we have not seen a proliferation of slap suits in Florida, because defendants like us know if we lose that, 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 that motion, we're going to be subject to fees. I wonder if I could return. There's, there's a little bit of a, a, sh a slight shell game going on. On the one hand, um, when you talk about the, the core speech nature of this protection, it's like you're focusing on that first clause of the definition that, I, that you and I were discussing earlier of 2A. And I agree. It's clearly core protected speech when we're talking about a matter under consideration by review of a governmental entity. The problem is you've told me that you're not traveling under that. You have instead said that no matter under consideration by a governmental entity is the subject of this. Thus, we're not really in core First Amendment speech land. It could be a blog post about beekeeping. It could be, you know, some other statement that isn't core to the mission. And yet you're telling us that we should be looking at that part of the definition in evaluating your entitlement to a prohibition here on litigation. I guess my question to you is jettisoning the, you know, battle hymn of the Republic style argument about core political speech. Can you defend the actual blog post at issue in this case and why that should be the subject of an anti-slap prohibition. Absolutely, Justice Correal. In, in this case, Mr. Vericker issued multiple blog posts about the village attorney for North Bay Village. In those posts, he documented how Mr. Powell was, in essence, not a nice guy, a corrupt guy, for, for lack of a better word. And by the way, he's been vindicated in multiple respects because of that. Mr. Mr. Powell lost his job in North Bay Village. And indeed, some of the positions that Mr. Vericker took were vindicated by the courts, other political speech that he engaged in. He called into question legal decisions or legal opinions that Mr. 
Powell provided to the city to the city council and explain why he thinks that that was wrong his interpretation of certain issues that goes to the heart of the First Amendment how we how we regulate and how we critique and talk about our public officials and when we chill speech we rob the marketplace of ideas and not just Mr. Vericker's ability to speak but the risk of punishment for doing so. And it robs the public itself of the right to hear those dissenting points of view. And that's why we have irreparable injury as well under the Constitution. The legislature has made a determination that these slap suits, as defined, infringe constitutional rights. My friends on the other side want you to disagree with the legislature and say, no, 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 we think that there is a subset of slap suits, as defined, that do not affect constitutional rights. We would submit to you that this role of this court is not to supplement or supplant the dictates of the legislature. I see my time is running short. I, I will say this and before reserving the rest of my time, that the Supreme Court has made it clear that even when you have, for a minimal period of time, an infringement on First Amendment rights, it is unquestionably irreparable harm. And that's what we have here. I'll reserve this my time for rebuttal. Thank you. You can have a, t a minute total for rebuttal. I'm sorry, Chief Justice. I mean, you almost ran out, but I'm giving you, oh, thank you. a little bit of extra for when you come back. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Fellow, fellow Justices, Andrew Feldman on behalf of the respondent, Norman Powell. Mr. Powell is also present here um, in front of your honors. Uh, to start with, I would take issue with the characterization that my client is not a nice guy. He happens to be a very nice guy. But moving more to the point, um, what you, what, the reason we are here is actually a relatively narrow legal question. Should these cases go up on certiorari review after a trial court has taken a look and determined that there are sufficient facts in the record following a summary judgment hearing to allow the case to go to trial applying the appropriate legal standard? The answer to that when you look at the history of your case law from Tucker to Keck to citizens' property um, to, uh, I, I believe it was uh, Curiel just recently, um, the, the UF case, is, is no. Certiorari is not the appropriate mechanism for this type of review. The Second District Court of Appeal in Gundell, with utmost respect to those judges, got it wrong. The Third District has said no. The Fourth District has said no. The First District has said no. And the Fifth District has said no. Don't you think that most of the district courts that have declined have felt that they were sort of bound by some of the language, especially in CAC, and it sort of indicated they thought some sort of review fit with the purpose uh, and sort of layout of the statute. They expressed reservations, they, they had concerns, but at the end of the day, they just felt that they could not grant that jurisdiction. How would you respond to that? I would first respond by the fact that thinking that they couldn't grant that jurisdiction based on years of jurisprudence from this court was the correct approach. And this court should not upend certiorari in the situation, especially over a statute like this, number one. Number two, what they did do was they suggested that this be looked at further. They did think that this was a question that should be looked at further. I think you saw that in our case coming out of the Third District Court of Appeal. This court actually had that opportunity to, to do that very thing. Our case was stayed. Multiple cases were stayed. Tag cases that are behind ours were stayed or also up with ours were stayed while this court considered a rule amendment and ultimately determined that the rules should not be amended to allow interlocutory review of this. So you have years of case law basically saying that cert is not the appropriate, cert is not appropriate here. That law shouldn't be overturned. So the courts were right. Yes, they were bound. But they also suggested that this be looked at, and it has been looked at. And there's frankly nothing new under the sun based on the recommendations that my friends who have brought this case before you are now asking that's really different from what this court looked at when it initially evaluated the rule, the rule amendment question and declined unanimously to amend the rule to allow review from these types of cases. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you address the First Amendment chilling aspect? Because that's, it's to me, that's the only part of the argument that sort of 
gave me pause. I mean, it seems like just the right not to be subjected to a meritless lawsuit seems like a garden variety thing that's been rejected as irreparable harm. But to the extent that, you know, I guess potentially if you're under one of these suits, it may prevent you from speak, you know, exercising your First Amendment rights, and there may be kind of a de facto sort of overbred type analogy. I mean, could you address that in the context of irreparable harm? Sure. So, I mean, I think that the issue of the question of the First Amendment and irreparable harm, first of all, Mr. Chief Justice, no one's going to question that First Amendment rights are important. There are plenty of rights that are important. The right to access to the courts enshrined in the Florida Constitution is, is, is important. It needs to be balanced here. But even when you look at First Amendment rights, irreparable harm, you still need a situation that cannot be resolved on plenary appeal. The fact that you've got a constitutional issue, whether it's a First Amendment or another avenue of the Constitution that raises an issue, those issues, constitutional issues, pop up all the time in litigation. Defamation but, but, cases. But, but, but do you concede that um, the harm that petitioner has articulated, if substantiated, would be an irreparable harm, a chilling of First Amendment speech? Chilling First Amendment speech? Yeah, I, I, I think it's pretty safe to say under our case law that, you know, a we've recognized that um, an impact of the kind alleged on the assertion of a constitutional freedom like the freedom of speech constitutes irreparable harm. Do you not concede that? I would concede that chilling First Amendment speech might cause irreparable harm. If you had a statute that chilled First Amendment speech, that would cause irreparable harm. Mr. Vereker has not been sued by Mr. Powell. And his speech has not been chilled. Well, I he, guess, I mean, he's been sued for... Obviously, if you guys disagree on the merits, defamation is right. not protected. The Correct. public figures, there's, there's this higher threshold. So I'm assuming that the irreparable harm argument in this context is that for the pendency of the litigation, the, you know, the person who would otherwise be continuing to make similar statements, and if it turns out that they are protected, then you basically can't get that, you can't get that time back. I mean, we're not talking about something, I mean, obviously the, this particular suit is about things that have already been said, but to the extent that you know, that the existence of the litigation is going to stop you from saying the same thing if it turns out that, in fact, it's protected, which I agree, we can't assume that it is, but isn't that the type of thing that we would, kind of looking back on it, then consider to have been irreparable harm? Uh, I mean, I think that this court, to start with, no, respectfully. Um, to, to start with, this court has said multiple times that engaging in ongoing litigation, the cost, the expense, the time of engaging in ongoing litigation is not irreparable harm. The First Amendment doesn't change that. To go back to your question, Judges Curiel, certainly if someone's speech was shut down, there would be a First Amendment issue. But Florida, you can't even, you can't get an injunction. What you have here is you have a situation where you have a party who has raised this issue at the 23rd hour. I mean, candidly, this case is the poster child of, of how this should not be done. We were, going, we were set for trial twice when this issue had popped up. If the, expedi if the legislature is thinking about expeditious resolution to avoid the impact of litigation, this is not the case that demonstrates that that was done. But that aside, th this, this issue has been raised. It's gone in front of the trial court. It's been rejected based on the facts that are in the evidence. And now the case needs to move forward to trial. You've got actually a right to access to the courts that's been delayed. Been, being denied, if you open up the idea of certiorari review, interlocutory review, to deal with these issues, what about the plaintiff's rights who has a right to get his case to the courts to move forward? All of this can be resolved at the end of the trial. Going to the question that was raised regarding attorney's fees, for example, the answer actually is no. You wouldn't get attorney's fees, just Grossens, if you, if, if you lost that claim and then won the case at trial unless there was some other mechanism to get it, like a proposal for settlement or something. Okay, but let me follow up with that. Statute. Let me follow up with a question on that. So we have a statute that arguably is designed to prevent meritless litigation in a very intentional way. 
which I don't think we've specifically addressed in sort of our cert review of saying ongoing litigation is not irreparable harm when we've had a statute that's like, this is prohibited. So we have that. And then we have a, a remedy of damage, attorney's fees, okay? So in your, and I think this is what I was asking the other side, and you, I think, agree with me. So bring this claim, lose, so a trial judge says, no, this doesn't apply. Clear error. We'll say the trial judge was wrong. They, now you're going to go through a trial, and according to your interpretation, there will be no entitlement to fees if the defense wins, correct? So the entire purpose of the statute is defeated. Now you went through a meritless lawsuit, and you don't get fees, correct? Am I correct in my hypothetical? If the, you, well, you're correct, but I think that the concern that you may be expressing is not actually um, correct, okay. if I may. Yes. So, so you are correct in the fact that the way that I read the statute, if you lose on the claim that's being brought, you don't get attorney's fees. The claim is that the action is in violation of the statute, which requires two things. It be without merit, and it be brought primarily because of the what the legislature is looking to avoid, which, by the way, is an inherently very factual question. But that aside, well, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be. I mean, one view of that is that you look at it objectively, and if it's about the speech that falls within the category of the statute, that's what the claim. That's that's the focus of the claim. Well, I mean, but but not but, what's in somebody's brain, but what's actually what the claim is. I, I, I understand that, but, but, but the, the idea or what the claim is or whatever it may be, if you're looking the person, it has to be, first of all, it has to mean something. If you, it, it can't just be without merit because you have without merit and primarily because. So the legislature put that in there to say we need more than a non-merit, a non-meritorious lawsuit here. We need a lawsuit that is also brought primarily because of this, primarily because this person is trying to shut down or in, primarily because this person is trying to shut down public participation. Respectfully, Justice Kennedy, unless it's sitting there on the face of the documents, on the face of the pleadings, that does require you to take a look at what the person is driving their decision making. And, 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 and going back to the question that, 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 that you talked about, Justice Grossens, in terms of the, the attorney's fees and does it defeat the remedy of the statute, no, because the legislature created the remedy. The legislature took this statute and created a mechanism with it. It's not 57105. 57105 doesn't have the primarily because component, number one. 57105, you can't implement it unless you give 21 days notice with a motion. This statute doesn't require a millisecond of notice. It's separate from 57105. 57105, you know, this is a prevailing party statute. This basically says whoever's going to raise this issue, if it's the petitioner or if it's the plaintiff, I'm sorry, when they file the lawsuit, be aware. If it's the defendant, when they raise the issue, be aware. You're going to throw this statute into the mix, whether it's by the bringing of your lawsuit or the raising of the claim, then, which the defendant has to do, right? The plaintiff's not going to come along and file a lawsuit and say it's a slap lawsuit, which the defendant has to do. You are now on the hook for attorney's fees tied to that claim. How does that constitute the prohibition that is promised in the title of the statute? It sounds like the statute you're describing would be titled something like um, slap suits penalized slap suits disincentivized, attorney's fees for slap suits. How do you, in what sense is what you're describing as the operative state of the law a prohibition on slap suits? And Justice Curiel, first of all, I would suggest that when you look at what the legislature generally does with statutes, legislative law generally does one of two things. It incentivizes people to do things, not incentivizes, it requires people to do things, or it prohibits people from doing things. It penalizes you for, for, 
for doing things. There's other statutes that are out there, whistleblower statutes, one that just kind of pops into mind that has a prohibition sitting there in the name of whatever it may be. The legislature doesn't, I don't, well, can you, can they're, you point they're not us, in the can I'm you sorry. Point, you, you, you're mentioning whistleblowers, and I'm wondering if that, I, I want to look at that, but can you point us to another statute that claims to prohibit some conduct, and then in the end, just affixes attorney's fees as a penalty for engaging in it? Is there any other example that fits what you're describing? I, I, I would, off the top of my head, candidly, and one's not coming to my mind, I know that the whistleblower was one that kind of popped into my head that went, that I, when, I, when I've seen that. Your argument that. Is, is it's like a prohibition plus a fine. We should think of the attorney's fees as a fine for the prohibited conduct in this context. Is that basically what you're saying? Well, you should think of attorney's fees as a consequence for the prohibited conduct in this, or, or the conduct the legislature is saying they don't want you to do. Which, is, again, stat, that's what statutes do. <laughs> they either require you to step forward, or they say you better not step forward. And in the civil arena, the legislature's number one way of um, enforcing that, of penalizing people for that, of incentivizing people for that, is attorney's fees. It's, it's the biggest hammer they have in the civil arena, or certainly one of the biggest hammers they have in the civil arena. Frankly, reading prohibited as immunity in a section of the code that in 13 other places defines immunity with specificity respectfully, Justice Curiel, is reading way too much in the statute. It, the legislature did it 13 times in 768 alone. They knew how to do it. I, mean, I don't know how it would so play can out you, here. Can you, sorry to interrupt you, can you help us understand this statute? Because I have to admit, the statute is such a mess. I mean, it's hard not to have the view of this case colored by how ridiculous this statute is. <laughs> but if you read section four, do you view this as sort of a two-step thing where the court, first the court is just considering a motion to dismiss or for summary judgment on the merits of the litigation, which is just like any other defamation case involving a public figure. And then do you view that there's this kind of step two where if the court determines that it's without merit, then it also has to entertain a summary judgment motion with these affidavits over whether it was quote unquote primarily because such person or entity exercise, which has this sort of whiff of sort of retaliation to it, which I know Justice Kennedy is saying one way to read it is to sort of collapse that into the merits and just say that kind of by definition, every one of these cases is going to have to do with speech about a public issue, right? So are, do you read this as basically this, this kind of factual question about the motivation for the lawsuit being a, like a kind of step, an in, kind of an independent issue that then, that then is in play after it's been determined to be without merit, just in terms of just looking at it as a garden variety lawsuit? I do, Mr. Chief Justice, and, 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 and so, I mean, I guess in the hypothetical, the trial court could potentially look to do both of those at one time. So if the court but, says that as a matter of just the regular law, it's, there's, I can't say that it's without merit, just, as a, just looking at it as a defamation case, then really the slap part of it never, re, never really comes into play, because in that sense, Arguably, the only thing that really makes a slap case different is this kind of extra thing about penalizing someone for having this kind of nefarious motive for filing the lawsuit. Yes, and 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 and, and, and by the way, when you look at the definition in terms, it's, or when you look at the description it, or the language, it basically says such lawsuits as here and described. It then lays out what that description is, and the legislature does it with an and in between them. So whether it would be in a hypothetical thing, one proceeding or, or a second one like you described of we've determined now it's without merit, let's look at the intent, it has to be both. They can't collapse. And, 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 and they're not separate. It's not an or. It's an and. And, and. and it has to mean something else because, I mean, without merit is... 
you don't need a statute even to do that. I mean, you know, it may well, yeah, also, you can't, can't I mean, the legislature period. doesn't, I mean, I don't know what it means to prohibit a lawsuit without merit. I, I don't know either. I mean, I, I, I don't. I don't know what it means to prohibit a lawsuit without merit. But, 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 but frankly, the, this, this statute, it has a, it has an enforcement mechanism. I, 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 I agree it's odd, but the way the statute is just worded as a whole, but it has an enforcement mechanism, and that enforcement mechanism is prevailing party attorneys. Can I ask you a very technical hypothetical? Yes, ma'am. All right, so we have um, the summary judgment denied by the trial court, no right to appeal. We go through a whole trial, defendant loses defendant appeals and has, you know, all of their points as a good appeal a lawyer will make. And the trial or the appellate court determines that that summary judgment should have been granted. So they should have prevailed on their anti-slap claim. Do they get fees for everything below? Is that the remedy that would be, because they should have won at that stage early on. And then I think the exact words are, uh, an action was filed in violation of this section. So you have a claim, which is really a pre-suit issue. It's not a trial issue. So is the remedy appropriate then that they would now get fees for this entire process or just for that portion related to the to the slot? Uh, Justice Chris, I'm not sure I can answer your, your question in the time remaining. May, may I run over? Go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you, sir. Um, so the, the answer, I think, to your question would be in that hypothetical, um, if the reason that they, they, if the reason it got reversed was because the denial of the summary judgment under the slap issue itself, under that claim, was erroneous, then yes. The person would have, I mean, have to file the appropriate motion at the appellate level and have made the appropriate movements at the trial level, et cetera. But assuming all the procedural boxes were checked um, to get that, then yes, because they would have ultimately prevailed on that, on that, um, on that claim. But that being reviewed at the appellate level is no different than any other situation where you have review of a of a denial of a summary judgment in a situation where there could be prevailing party attorney's fees and that happens frankly whether it's statutory or it's or it's um, or it's contractual which provides for fees that happens all the time um, if I may just briefly cl close up, Mr. Chief Justice, um, at this point in time, the appropriate thing to do, we would submit, is certiorari is not appropriate here. The third district got it right. This court should affirm the decision of the third district court of appeal. It should reverse Gundell to the extent that Gun and the, the second district decisions that have followed it to the extent that they're inconsistent with the decision of this court. It should lift the stay that's going on in the trial court below, and it should allow Mr. Powell to have his day in court and finally take this to trial when a summary judgment has been denied. Thank you for your time, Your Honors. Thank you. My friends on the other side made a lot of concessions that I think are helpful to this discussion. You heard them concede to your question, uh, uh, Justice Grosshands, that there's a reading of the statute that would essentially render it meaningless. You get no right to fees, and you don't get the expeditious resolution of your claim. Turning to Justice Kennedy, you're absolutely right. There is not a motivation requirement in the statute. How do we know? We look to the plain text of the statute, and we ignore hyper-literal readings. If we read subsection 3 as requiring a mental state requirement, that totally is in contradistinction to subsection 4, where the legislature has designed that slap motions will be resolved at the pleading stage. There is no scenario that any defendant is going to know the mental state of a plaintiff at the pleading stage. It's inconsistent. And by the way, if we turn back to subsection 3, it's inconsistent to have a suit that has merit 
that relates to speech that's protected by the Constitution. We should not read these as separate elements. The legislature is describing a type of suit that the Constitution already prohibits, and is saying that you already have immunity from liability, we're now adding immunity from suit. This statute does something. Resist the urge to render it nugatory, to render it meaningless. That's not what this court is engaged in doing. Can I ask you, a, this may be a really stupid question, but is this, do you view this statute as only dealing with these sort of cases where the, sub, the subject matter of the lawsuit itself has to do with speech, or could it be, you know, I sue you for you know, some employment violation, but it turns out that my motivation for it is to punish you for speech. It, it's it's the former, just Chief Justice Muniz. It has to do, and it says that in the statute, subsection three, speech well, as go sorry, ahead. speech as protected by the First Amendment as well as the Florida Constitution. And and we heard our friends on the other side concede that the chilling of speech is irreparable harm. Right. But what they told you is that that only applies if it's a statute. That's but, not what the U.S. But it seems like if you just read the statute, it could be talking about suits where the the litigation itself has nothing to do with speech on its face, but the motivate the so the law you know you can't file a lawsuit without merit, part one, and then if it turns out, which could the lawsuit could have any, could be related to anything, part two, your motivation for filing the lawsuit was because such person or entity has exercised the constitutional right of free speech, but you're saying that's not what this statute is about. Every single case is going to be a speech case. It's going to be a speech case, or and speech has different varieties. So it could be petitioning the government. That's expressly covered in the subsection 2A, which Justice Coriel spoke about. But yes, it's talking about First Amendment speech. And our, what our friends conceded is you can have irreparable harm when you're chilling a speech. But what they told you is you need to have a statute that infringes on speech to have that irreparable harm. That's not what the U.S. Supreme Court said in Sullivan. Sullivan created substantial rights that were based on a defamation lawsuit and the idea that you needed to have breathing room for the First Amendment. So they unwittingly have conceded the very essence of our case. Okay, you can. You have 30 seconds to wrap up. All right. So for, the, for these reasons, we request that the court quash the third district decision below. If the goal here is to stop slap suits, the way to do that is to grant its to review. If we render the slap statute meaningless or nugatory or simply attorney's fees, it will be open season for slap suits in Florida. You will get suits against speakers on the right and speakers on the left, and we will totally defeat the legislative purpose. We thank you for your time. We ask that you, again, quash decision, grant certiorari review, or retroactively amend Rule 9.130 so that we may proceed in third DCA. Thank you okay. for your time. Thank you very much. Okay, our next case is number 2023-0095, Boyorquez versus State of Florida.
Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, Brian Gowdy, on behalf of the Taxi Medallion owners, I'm going to try to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. The word property is used 143 times in our state constitution, including in the Due Process Clause. But the phrase private property is used only twice, in the Takings Clause and another eminent domain provision, but not in the Due Process Clause. Black's Law Dictionary gives multiple meanings for, for the word property, but it provides a single definition for private property. That is, property protected from public appropriations over which the owner has exclusive and absolute rights. In 2012, the legislature expressly established my client's medallions as private property. Do they not have exclusive and what was the other word you used? <clears throat> absolute. An they, absolute right over it? They do, because all property, even real property, is subject to extensive regulations. Um, and I may be prohibited from building things on my property, and unless I meet uh, you know, some very stringent per se test under the regulatory taking jurisprudence, uh, I'm stuck with that. But I still have the right to use, the right to exclude, and the right to transfer and so do my clients with these medallions. I wonder if we could just start with a sort of baseline um, question about the takings clause. Is, um, I think you would agree, because you've briefed it um, very well, um, that the um, takings clause in the Florida Constitution is textually quite different from the federal um, takings clause. And as you indicated, it is not a due process provision. It indeed is contextually different. Is this the case in which we should, we should say that we should no longer interpret those two clauses, the Federal Takings Clause and the Florida Takings Clause, as the same, um, given their textual differences? And if so, how does that break for your client? Right. Um, well, yes, if that's, you're going to rule in favor of my client. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, but I take your point. I, I would say this. Um, I think we're here on the words private property, and those two words are the same. Uh, I think uh, when you talk about compensation, the words are different. Full compensation and, versus and, and, just and compensation. I think, I think actually this court has recognized that, that there's differences here. So um, uh, of course this court is free to, to read the Florida Constitution's uh, private property provision takings clause more expansively than the federal. There's nothing, we, we don't have anything in our Constitution like we do with the uh, Eighth Amendment uh, where you're constrained by our Constitution to, to read it the same way. So um, I think you could make that case. I'm not sure that this has to be that case because we're talking about the words private property and obviously uh, both sides have relied extensively on federal uh, case law and case law from other states. Can I ask so. you a question about your reply brief, page 12? Because this sentence makes me not understand your argument here. It says, while the 2017 legislature could have prohibited the operation of taxi cabs or the sale of medallions, which it did not do, without compensation, so the legislature could prohibit you, so you have a medallion, but the legislature could pass a law saying you may no longer operate a taxi cab or you can keep your medallion but you cannot sell it. The legislature can do that without compensation, but it lacks the sovereign power to abolish the taxi cabs or the medallions unless it paid compensation. I don't understand how that doesn't undermine your whole point in the sense that really what, if you look at what the state did here, they basically just deregulated the field and sort of walked away from it. And I mean, if we accept the fact that the county is out of it, the state basically just said, we're repealing the prohibition on driving a cab. We're repealing the medallion program. It's all going away. Everybody for this instant in time can do whatever they want. But just looking at it from a, you know, if, if you say that you have property in the medallions, how could you, how could the legislature prohibit the operation of a cab or the sale of the medallions without, quote unquote, taking the property, under well, your theory. So, all right, first of all, the taking here is the, is the repeal in, in Section 2 of the 2017 Act. It's, re, it's no different than 
then rescinding the land grant that in the 1854 Minnesota case. Um, and we acknowledge that the state has extensive regulatory power, uh, not just over taxi cabs, but say greyhounds. If they want to prohibit the sale of greyhounds and prohibit uh, the, uh, the, the, that those from being exchanged because of some public policy and prohibit greyhounds from racing, well, admittedly, those regulations will cause the value of the property to still go, to go down tremendously. But it's still my property. It's still my greyhound at that but with, point. But, but without, then, a, without a regulatory scheme, this property has no value, right? With, I mean, the, the, the value of the medallion is entirely dependent upon the existence of the regulatory scheme. Well, that's true for many types of property. That's I agree with you, but that's true for trade but, secrets. But not a greyhound, right? Not greyhounds. Okay. So, that, so my analogy breaks down there. But it's true for trade secrets. It's true for patents. It's true for copyright. It's true for a whole host of intangible property rights. Without the framework of the state or federal law, well, at some level, it's true of every sort of property. I mean, exactly. Got, even even like land rights. Uh, well, that's true, but, and that's what the treatises but, say. But but there are just there are differences between these things that are traditionally um, thought of as those sorts of property rights, and and these property rights that flow exclusively from this this sort of regulatory scheme. And the problem I've the, what I struggle with is when you look, and you're not challenging the 2001 Act in any way, if I understand your argument Correct. correctly. You challenge that in no way. And embedded in that uh, are provisions that allow for the uh, uh, dissolution of the regulatory scheme. And if that, if that, if, if you're not challenging that provision that allows for the dissolution of the regulatory scheme, that's what happened. They did away with the regulatory scheme. So I don't. I, I'm, I'm having trouble seeing how uh, that that your your uh, your your claim doesn't just collapse based on on that uh, provision uh, of this earlier statute that you don't or not or, or law that you don't challenge. That and it's in, you know it's in. Uh, 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 let's see where is it? Section 17. Yeah, section out. 17. So I would point you to page one of my reply brief, Your Honor. Um, it does not say what you said or the state said. It does not give the state the right to dissolve a scheme. What it says is it has the right to dissolve the district, which is the commission. And all that means is that once the, di once the district or the commission is dissolved, that there's a successor regulator, which is the county by default. It is, does in no way say, like these other statutes and cases that are cited in the state's answer brief, that the scheme can be. And this but is that's a whole different. But it seems like that. It's the, not the whole. The scheme is dependent upon the existence of the district. I, I, I really struggle. It seems to well, be. Then, like if a, I could give you an analogy, I, I have a corporation I own. I have shares in it. Every year I file articles of incorporation with the Division of Corporations. Incorporate, I'm sorry, Division of Corporations. When I fail to do so, then the, I'm, I'm inactive and I'm no longer a corporation. Now, suppose tomorrow the legislature decided to dissolve the Division of Corporations. Under the, your rationale and the state's, all the corporations are gone. Because to have a corporation, you're dependent on the state. Without the state of Florida establishing that division of corporations, we don't have any corporations in the state. And so all Here's this provision does, it. well, all this provision does is say, we're in the state of Florida, the legislature could do this tomorrow. We're no longer gonna have the division of corporations, supervised corporations, but what would it do? It would have a successor regulator. I don't know. I, I, Part of what we're doing here with these different analogies, I, I find that nothing quite fits, and I struggle the same way Justice Kennedy does. When if the if we if the state abolished the division of corporations, it would perhaps abolish a mode of ownership. But if the corporation owned a tractor, the tractor isn't vaporized. Similarly, with a trade secret, if we changed, if Congress changed the copyright or trademark or patent law applicable, 
it might alter the degree of regulatory protection, the monopolistic interest that one has in the underlying asset. But the asset would remain. The trouble in your case is that there is no underlying asset in the medallion. The medallion is a pure license. We're not talking about the cab. We're not talking about the hours spent driving. We're talking about the license to operate in a particular regulatory scheme that the state chose to have, but might have chosen otherwise, or to have no regulatory scheme at all. And I think that's that, what I'm struggling with is, in your analogy, there is no underlying asset. There's I, just the license. Right. So uh, I guess uh, to try to respond to that, there is an underlying asset. It's the taxi. Um, uh, we're not here on a claim saying they took the automobile, though. Right. And so to your example uh, about the corporation, let's go back to the railroads. I recite in the re uh, reply. Yeah, I think your best case is the ferry case, right? The, is, aren't the ferry cases the ones that come closest to this idea that, hey, I don't own the river, and we're not talking about the boat. We're talking about the right to operate a ferry on the boat, and that has value. That, those, are, those are good cases. I also think I talk on the same page 12 of the reply brief that the Chief Justice, I, I cite to the Mills and Abbott treatise, it's a 19th century treatise, and it talks about the fact that, the, the, and this would happen actually, that the corporation owns the railroad. So there's your underlying asset. But what if, what if all of a sudden the, 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 the intangible sh shares, the corporation is taken? Well, that's, that's a taking that's of loss to the owner because of the shares. And just because the rail cars are there, that doesn't mean anything because you've taken the actual corporation. And what it says. But what, what, what you've been, what your clients have been deprived of is their position in a government established cartel. And that, that, that's what it boils down to. Well, you, and I don't, you like mean that, and I don't even cartel. I don't mean to use the word cartel. We're not OPEC, but I don't, um. I don't mean to use it in a, a pejorative sense, but just in a descriptive sense. That's what this regulatory scheme did. It set up a a limited number of uh, actors in this market, and they derived a privilege from that. Uh, but that's what this is about. It's a, it's about what was created for this market. Uh, by that uh, regulatory scheme. Well, I think it's that's part of it, but it's more than that. As the amicus brief points out, my clients were a, were able to put these in their estate planning documents. Tell me what you can put in your estate planning documents that is not Hope Springs private. Eternal. <laughs> I mean, people who everybody who's in a cartel hopes it'll go on forever, but we know that cartels don't always go on forever. Well, you know, this was the same problem in all these bridge cases I cite. Is that a, bri a bridge? A bridge would be built, okay. And, a and contrary to what the state says in its answer brief, it wasn't just for ten years. Some of these franchises for, that were given at the founding of the country were for a hundred years. And then somebody started to realize, you know, it'd be nice if we had another bridge that we didn't have to pay a toll for. And the issue in those cases, though, and this is the key distinction, in each of those cases, it didn't happen what was happened here, where the state repealed the franchise. What the state did was it allowed Uber to come in and operate. It allowed another bridge to come operate right next door. And we're not here on that claim. Aren't those infrastructure cases different, though? They're, they're fulfilling a public purpose that otherwise the government would be fulfilling. It's almost like a delegation of governmental power to the people who are going to build the bridge or provide the infrastructure gap. And here, that's not what's happening. It's, it's this specific issue. It's not necessarily a, you know, we can't get across the river without the bridge, public purpose sort of situation. It's more akin to the license. I disagree, and I, I'd encourage you to read the amicus brief all the way through, because taxi cabs, um, well, then you would have seen in there talking about how this is public transportation, just like the bridge, just like the buses, just like the streetcars. And I guess that's what I'm asking. Why, why is this? It's public why is it not an infrastructure? It, it, why is that not a distinction? Because it is, well, it's, it's public transportation because uh, taxi cab drivers are required to go anywhere in the county, even when it's not profitable. They're required to get people for emergencies. They have, they are, it is not like Uber, which is, I'll just go where I want to go. It is public transportation for all the public. So um, 
it it it's so not it's not about, building um, a bridge, but it's providing public transportation to the citizens of Pearlsboro County. I think I understand the argument. Can you go to uh, the 2001 Act again? I just had a question. Um, why why is it not a kind of hyper literal hyper literal reading to say that there must be a successor regulator um, and that this dissolution provision in the Act does not relate to the entire structure of the Act if if the if it's being created in the circumstances and it says that the district can be dissolved. Well, keep in mind that uh, if, if you go through the history, there's been a successor of many different regulators of taxis. Um, uh, and before even this, we're calling this the commission, there was a predecessor commission, right? And then you can go back uh, to the time that we were first automobiles and, and there was power given to individual municipalities, the cities, not the counties. And then at some point in time, we made the default provision to be the county. So um, I think that the fact that the, the, the historical perspective is that we've never just had no regulator. It's just the regulator has been constantly changing. And so I think the fair reading of that text, not the hyperliteral, is that the legislature has the power to choose the, the regulator. It could be the county, it could be the city, it could be an independent special district, and it's used all of those in the last century and a quarter or so. So we need, to, we need to read this as there must be a regulator. <laughs> no, all I'm trying to say is that the power here was not, it's repeatedly said in the brief that it says it could, that if you look at all the cases, the other cases that are being cited, it does have that broad language that says, you know, there, there is no right created here and it can be, be rescinded at any time. We don't have that language here. We just say you're dissolving the commission. Could you be and, specific then? I think it would help us if you could disaggregate sort of this, the rights that you think are the property. The rights because, that are the property? Yeah, because, sure. because I think if we, if we accept the premise that the property right is defined by the sort of understandings, the mutual understandings, we have to know what, what exactly are the things, what is the quote unquote property that you had in the medallions that you, that you, have that you claim is protected. Right. Well, so I would t point to the three classic rights that you'll see in all the treaties. Right. No, but so, specifically with the medallions. Yeah, I'll, 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 br I'll break it down. The, the easiest, obviously, is the right to transfer and devise. Okay, so you, you said in, your bri in the reply brief that the legislature could have prohibited the sale without compensation. There was, that's right, but you could still give it. You could still give it away. You could prohibit me from selling my dog, but I could still give it. Okay. I mean, in other words, I acknowledge there can be restrictions on commerce. And if, they, if the state was exercising its commerce power to restrict the transfer of property, then that is a sovereign power. Okay, so the, one right is the, is the transfer right. And it's a broad right okay. that was given. What else? And then the other two rights that have been is the, is the right to exclude and the right to use or possess. So the right to exclude here is I'm the only person that gets to use this certificate of public convenience and this permit, this medallion. I'm the only one that gets to drive this taxi and that I'm allowed to to charge these rates and do all of this, the okay. cartel. And so in order for that to rise, though, to a property right, you have to have some sort of expectation that it's going to continue indefinitely, right? I would not say that, no. You don't? No, because I could, okay. what if I, no, I don't agree with that. I, I, some of these franchise rights were only for 10 years. Well, but they were contracts. The well, franchise, the, I mean, and you, the contract, I understand that you're responding to where the second DCA, when it was responding to the dissent, it sort of went off on this tangent about positive law and property or whatever, but right. your initial argument had nothing to do with franchises or contracts or anything like that. It was very much tied to the language of the of the 2012 statute and the label. Of yeah, no, no, I, I agree with that, but I, I, I guess I'm trying, let me get back to answer your question. There's the, there's the right to, to use, which I think I went over. Uh, well, it's, and the right to exclude is, is similar in that other people can't use my license, can't use my medallion, can't use my certificate of public convenience, all right? And I, if somebody else is using it, I can prevent that. But, but isn't the value, if we're talking about actual value, economic value, we'll isn't the actual economic value dependent upon 
the regulatory scheme which limits the number of medallions. Right. So and that's what it all boils down to. And because if everybody can get a medallion, then this medallion becomes worthless. Right. So that that's that's the question when we go back, Justice Kennedy. You're talking about what what is the value, the market value of these medallions, and what's the appropriate compensation. And if it turns out that there's a million medallions, my clients aren't likely to get much compensation. But that's not the question before the court, because. Uh, I have a million Legos in my house. Each of them is a piece of property. And if I have a million medallions, each of them is a piece of property. You may, you may say it's de minimis. That's what I'm hearing your, your line of questioning. But that's not the question before the court. The question is, is this private property and was it taken? And then we're going to get to what you're talking about. And I think we're going to put, when we get there, we're going to put on evidence that's laid out in the amicus brief that you could get loans off this. So it's not so de minimis as you're suggesting that you that people paid serious money for these medallions. But that'll be the evidence that's created when we go back. Okay. I, I see I've gone way, way over. You can have two minutes for a <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to argue. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. When the state grants a right in a statute, it generally does not convey property under the takings clause. The reason is that the state reserves the power to repeal its statutes and change its regulatory frameworks, so a statute typically does not convey the kind of concrete interests that the takings clause protects. And that rule is critical because it provides the state with room to regulate and respond to changing conditions by creating and abolishing all types of statutory frameworks without having to regulate by purchase. Now, there's an exception to that rule recognized in the case law, and it's that the state can elevate a statutory interest to property under the takings clause in very limited circumstances where it effectively promises to preserve the interest from future regulation. That's like a contract or a promise case uh, that you see in cases like Bowen. But for my friends to prove that the takings clause has created, or excuse me, that the uh, state has created such a promise, my friends have to provide clear evidence to that effect. And here, petitioners say that the 2012 Act created that kind of promise uh, by promising that the state would preserve their state-created grants to their taxi cab cartel. But as this court has recognized many times, Statutory context is king when it comes to construing statutes. And here the context makes clear that the state did not create any sort of promise to an everlasting taxi cartel to use the descriptive use of the word. Uh, and I think one important piece of context is one that you touched on, Justice Kennedy, and it's the idea that the state expressly reserved the power to dissolve the medallion framework entirely. In Section 17 of the 2001 Act, it reserved the ability to dissolve the district. And in this context, the district is the medallion framework. The 2001 Act is shot through with references to the PTC. The PTC decided when medallions would issue, when they'd be revoked, when they could be transferred, and what safety restrictions the, uh, the medallions were subject to. And we think that when the state creates that kind of complex regulatory framework that runs through a regulator, when it says we reserve the ability to dissolve the district, it says we are reserving the power to dissolve the whole framework. And yet, uh, the statute does seem to make a purposeful choice in using the words private property. How do you respond to your friend's, I think, very persuasive argument that that is a unique concatenation of words that elsewhere in our statutes is given a certain effect. It's certainly unique, Justice Curiel, but to quote Walt Whitman, the words private part property are large. They contain multitudes. They mean different things in different contexts. Wow. And we have to look at the but context. Yeah, that, that's, that's um, artful. Um, but, but isn't it true that we, we tend to um, treat likes like in statutory interpretation? I mean, we presume consistent usage. We call it a canon, right? That, that's certainly true, but this court also adheres to the canon that all words must be construed in context, and so the court has to look to the statutory scheme as a whole. So what is it about this context that, I mean, it would seem to me, going back to where we started about the characteristics of property ownership, you've got a pledgeable asset, right, an asset that can be used as collateral, um, which implicates not just the owner's um, certainty in the asset, but also if it's if it, if it can be pledged as collateral for loans, 
that speaks to the force it has in the marketplace. It means that there is um, a gamble, but a settled expectation enough that says that not only do I, the license holder, have the ability to, to operate this franchise, but others in the market are counting on it and pledging money against it, but using it as collateral, willing to extend it. It seems like while I, I follow the argument that the state has the statutory power to do away with this at any time, it does seem that by having that component of usage, by calling it private property, um, there is a pretty good case that the state can't just do it without compensation, especially, and here I'll go to where I started today, and I'll ask you the same question I asked the other side, given that our Constitution says something different about takings than the federal Constitution. It says full compensation as opposed to just compensation, and it isn't housed in the Due Process Clause. I mean, should we take from this milieu, this context, and this use which we assume is purposeful and which we assume is uniform with other uses of private property, the pledgeability of the asset, to say that there is something compensable here. No, I don't think that so, Justice Curiel, and just to touch on a few points. One, we agree with my friend that the court shouldn't decide whether the takings clause is different under our Constitution than the federal Constitution here. It's totally unbriefed. That would be a pretty big issue. But more importantly, this case turns on private property. Those words are the same in both constitutions. Full compensation is really not the issue here. Um, but to touch on your point about the transfer rights, you know, I think I'd have two responses. First, on the facts of this case, transfer rights were not absolute. In fact, we think the transfer scheme cuts the other way because the PTC retained at all times full ability to deny transfers, except in the case where the medallion was given to an heir. And even in that circumstance. What about borrowing? What about pledging it as collateral? So uh, again, I mean, absolutely, it could be pledged as collateral. That's no, not. No, was that subject to regulatory approval? Uh, I, I don't think so, Justice Curiel, but that's that's not really different from other licensing schemes. For example, in the liquor licensing context, licenses liquor licenses are transferable in a way. They are commercial property. They can be subject to liens. They can be used as collateral, but they still are subject to revocation. And of course, the state could ban liquor entirely and abolish all the licenses, and it wouldn't need to pay compensation. And I think that's really the key here. There are many ways to define property under the takings clause. It can get quite confusing. But a rule that we know is that if the state retains the ability to destroy the interest, it has not created property under the takings clause. It has reserved the power to destroy it. So you can't say to have had the right to exclude the government from your interest. And that's why when the state creates a licensing scheme, the state doesn't create compensable property because it always reserves the power to destroy that interest. So here, if you're with me, that the state always reserved the ability to destroy destroy this regulatory scheme, my friend doesn't have compensable property regardless of his transfer rights. Can you, so one thing that kind of gives me pause about this is that if the way that back at the early stages of the litigation in front of the trial court where the state and the county were still sort of pointing at each other and the county was still in the case, the state took the position that basically it would be irrational and kind of arbitrary to think that the, that the, that the intent of this legislation was to wipe everything out and then just kind of have this clean slate at the county, that it was, you know, being hyper-formalist and, you know, I, I can't remember, but it, but it made it sound, you know, the part of the state's argument was like, there's no way that, you know, that what you're saying we did by wiping out this quote-unquote property and making you go start from scratch, that, that that's an unreasonable way of looking at what we did. Now this case gets to us and basically you're asking us to sort of put our imprimatur on the state's ability to do something that the state at the initial stages of the litigation said would be kind of arbitrary and unreasonable. So yeah. could you could you address that? Certainly, Chief Justice. So I think that as we understood the case back then, we were simply arguing that the county certainly had the ability to honor these medallions if it so chose. Um, but I didn't understand us to be taking the, the, the concrete position that these medallions simply are um, would continue to exist for certain. And well, I mean, he didn't say that, but he, but basically we're now having to read this as if the state sort of consciously wiped the slate clean, did almost like a deregulatory taking, and then just said, hey, good luck with the county. Yeah. And the state's position was, no, that's a crazy way of looking at what happened here. But yet, and yet now, that's what we're going to be saying if we agree with you. We're going to be saying, oh, yeah, that's, that's fine. The state could do that. Yeah, I, I don't think that, 
I don't recall that as being exactly what we argued below, but to the extent that I'm wrong about that, Mr. Chief Justice, we obviously didn't win on that view, and I don't think that we're barred from taking that position here. And in fact, that's just the right view of the law. Because when you have a, a context like this, a regulatory scheme, that it's clear that the state has created a contained framework that seems to rise and fall on the existence of a regulator, it's understood that the elimination of the regulator would bring with it the licenses that the regulator issued. And so would, would we, to the extent that we don't want to sort of give a blank check for government just doing whatever it wants, um, would you say that we would need to rely on other parts of the Constitution to prevent the state from saying something like, you know what, you know, these people have invested all this money in, in these medallions, but we'd like to see if there are other people who can do it better. So we're going to wipe out the existing medallions, keep the district, and say, you've got to issue the same number of new ones, but just to different people. Yeah. I mean, what's the, what's the constitutional, is there any constitutional protection against that? Well, I think the due process clause could provide that kind of protection. The government generally can't do things that are totally irrational and unreasonable. But I don't think this court should be too concerned about the possibility that the state would go and, um, and create medallions or licenses and then just you know, um, not give the people who paid money for those licenses the benefit of the doubt, because there will be substantial political pressures, of course, pushing back against that. And more importantly, when you're dealing with the government, you know, as I think uh, Chief Justice Reinquist put it in the Windstar dissent, you have to turn square corners at times, and you know going in that you take this license, that one day it might not exist anymore. It's baked into the value of the license. So regardless of whether... Could, could I ask a question related that occurs to me? When the medallions were issued, what, uh, what, what was the charge associated with the providing of the uh, medallions? I, mean, I think I understand you to be asking Justice Kennedy what, what were medallion holders required to do with the medallion? No, what, were they, uh, what did oh. they have to pay the district to get a medallion? Oh. I think it was a very small license fee. Basically, it was an application fee. fee. Very small licensing fee, exactly, okay. exactly. So not, not something actually associated with the value of the medallion. Correct, correct. And there, was, there were transfer fees that you'd have to pay, but they weren't associated. More like transactional fees. Exactly, right. exactly. And I think it's important to note here that even under the PTC's framework, after the 2012 enactment, the PTC still retained substantial authority under uh, to, to abolish the interest. For example, after the 2012 enactment, the state still endowed the PTC with the power to revoke or suspend. Do you read that, though, as sort of an individualized determination, or do you read that as the PTC could just say, hey, you know, we're, we're tired of you having a medallion, yet, you know, we're taking it away. I, I, mean, I, think I that, didn't read that as being necessarily as expansive as what you're saying. I, I think that the, I think I do read it that way. Now, of course, the PTC was entitled to create rules that constrained its discretion, but the legislature simply used the words, and I think it was Section 5 double D, that says the PTC shall have the power to revoke or suspend medallions. Um, and, and that unconstrained grant is more consistent with a licensing scheme, a scheme where the, the regulator can abolish the interest in its discretion. I mean, everything about this is more consistent with licensing except for calling it private property. <laughs> that, that's right. And I mean, and I think you guys below were pretty, each side was candid about the fact that this is a unique, there's no case that's exactly, I mean, the general framework obviously favors you, but this weird, you know, reference to private property it makes, it, you know, it, it, it causes you to, you know, it raises an eyebrow, I yeah. mean, as you've heard. Yeah, it's weird. I agree, Mr. Chief Justice. But I think when you look at the context of the entire scheme, you know, we've given two other constructions for what the words private property more likely meant. Uh, the one that I think is most persuasive is that the court, uh, the legislature was legislating against the backdrop of a number of common law cases recognizing that you can make a license commercial property in a sense by giving it transferability. That's the liquor licensing cases that we cite. But that doesn't make it property in the constitutional sense to the extent that the taking clause is implicated. Uh, and also, I think that there is a difference between property under the takings clause and property under the due process clause. And we think that the words private property here alongside the transfer process could be understood as well to be cre creating some sort of due process protections for these interests. You know, under the prior scheme, the, the 2001 Act, um, there were procedures for post-deprivation process, but there were no procedures for pre-deprivation process. So the private property language could have been understood to, to trigger those types of protections. Uh, but I, I, I would you address, I, I, sorry, to, yes, um, can you address, there, there's one aspect of the case that the petitioners do want us to split state and federal doctrine, and that's in kind of like unmistakability doctrine, that sort of thing. 
Um, the reply brief points out that it hasn't been applied in Florida. Can you talk about this idea, kind of big picture, that one legislature can't bind another and how that should be applied in this case? Certainly, Justice Sasso. I'd like to note at the front end that our case does not turn on the unmistakability doctrine. This court can apply general principles of statutory construction to, to reach the result that there was no compensable property interest. But taking the question head on, it is no doubt true that one legislature can't bind another. However, legislatures can enter into binding promises or contracts that give statutory interests the, uh, a measure of concreteness so that they have protection under the takings clause. The unmistakability doctrine kicks in because generally the state does not give away its power to regulate in the future and doesn't make any promises about how it's going to regulate in the future. So the unmistakability doctrine says, look, if the plaintiff's claim turns on the state having promised to regulate in a particular way, here it would be preserving the medallion framework forever, that promise has to be unmistakably clear from the face of the statute. And the words private property just don't provide that clear and unmistakable uh, reading because we've given many reasons to doubt the word, that the words private property amounted to compensable property that the legislature could never destroy. Um, and I would want to touch on one, one point that my friend raises in the reply brief. You know, my, my friend relies on justice, the Justice Souter plurality construction of the unmistakability doctrine. Uh, we don't think that that plurality is binding on anyone, of course not binding on this court considering Florida law, but we'd also note that five justices in Windstar rejected that narrow construction of unmistakability. Justice Scalia in a concurrence joined by Justices Thomas and Kennedy and Chief Justice Rehnquist in a dissent joined by Justice Ginsburg all adopted our construction and said the principle applies whenever the promise is that the state would regulate in a particular way. And to the point that you raised, Justice Sasso, about my friend saying the doctrine's never been applied in Florida, that's incorrect. On page 22 of our answer brief, we cite two cases where the doctrine has been applied in Florida. This court applied the doctrine in a case called Colon versus Sunhaven Homes. And uh, the first district applied the doctrine in a case called Santa Rosa County versus Gulf Power, where, which was quite similar to our case. The claim was that a statute had effectively promised that the state wouldn't charge fees to a business for using a right of way. And the first district said, no, there's nothing unequivocally clear on the face of the statute that the legislature had made any promise, so we're not going to conclude that the legislature had bound itself. Um, and, and this is just another way to say that we're interpreting the statute in context. So it may say private property, but it's in the context of the, in, the structure of the Constitution, which allows one legislature to amend statutes. It, exactly. That's how Justice Scalia explains it in Windstar. And it's really no different than many clear statement rules that courts apply to figure out whether the government has parted with its sovereign authority. This court requires a clear statement to show that the government has waived sovereign immunity. Similarly, courts require a clear statement to show that the legislature has delegated with substantial power under the major questions doctrine. And the unmistakability doctrine is no different. It, it sounds in the general rule born out of the separation of powers that courts should not lightly construe the legislature to have parted with its power and its obligation to change its laws to meet the public's needs. So when the, that, the plaintiff's claim turns on that kind of promise, the promise has to be unmistakably made. Two other points I wanted to raise about the context of the scheme apart from the unmistakability doctrine. My friend mentioned that, Frank, that he, the medallions here were franchises and that franchises you know, were historically granted for a long period of time in some circumstances. I think that's true. The problem here is that these medallions had no time limit whatsoever. So if petitioners are right that the 2012 Act created some sort of compensable franchise, that means with just two words, the state bound itself to honor a taxicab cartel forever, no matter how much that cartel might hurt the state or its citizens in the future. We just don't think that's a reasonable construction of the statute. Uh, and I'd also note that petitioners say that their medallions are like franchises, but the 2001 Act used the words franchise and contract a lot. Uh, in fact, the, the definition of taxi cab excluded from it cars operated pursuant to franchise. The fact that the legislature didn't use the words that petitioners claimed their medallions to be in the 2012 Act and instead used different words, private property, suggests that the legislature didn't understand itself to be creating a franchise that is a compensable property right under the takings clause. If this court has no further questions, we'd ask that you approve the decision of the second district. Thank you. Thank you very much.
So my friend started with the words generally and typically, and I would agree with that. Uh, but here we have the express words private property, and I don't see how you rule for my friend without basically saying we're not going to do what the legislature said. Um, maybe that was a poor policy choice to put those put those words in there, but they obviously were put in there purposely, and they they don't mean just property. Um, all the cases that you're hearing about uh, food stamps, employment, all those, where you're dealing with due process clause cases. Um, here the legislature used the words that are in the takings clause, and I cite the Kepner case from the Supreme Court that when the legislature uses the words in the Constitution that have a well-developed meaning for 200 years, that the presumption is that you will apply those words the same when interpreting the statute. So the, the presumption he's talking about is flipped here because the legislature expressly adopted two words that you see only twice in our Constitution. Uh, the other thing on the unmistakability doctrine, uh, I, I think the thing you should go, uh, go re I know I said this and you're maybe telling me you already read them, but there's another case pending in this court on the sovereign immunity uh, doctrine with the university. The Solicitor General filed a brief. That's a contract case and the unmistakability doctrine is not talked about in there. So I find it very odd that this court would interject the unmistakability doctrine that's basically a federal contract doctrine into a takings case and we're not talking about it in another case involving contracts. Um, Justice Scalia, we win with his concurrence. So whether you like the plurality or the concurrence, we win under both. The words private property are unmistakable. They have an unmistakable meaning. And if you say that private property can be taken without compensation, then those words were meaningless. And I would ask that you reverse and grant the relief we requested in the conclusion section of the brief. Thank you very much. We'll be in recess for 10 minutes. All rise.
Unfortunately, all the kids left. Well, they didn't back in. They were like virtually. Oh, really? I don't think they should put them in for these cases. Oh, really? This is, I think, it's like a little um, not appropriate. <laughs> Some of this stuff.
All rise. The Florida Supreme Court is now in session. Please be seated. We'll now take up case number 2023-0079, Sexton versus State of Florida. May it please the court. I'm Karen Kinney on behalf of John Sexton. Uh, this is a capital direct appeal from a resentencing. I'm asking this court to reverse for a new penalty phase based on a number of errors, starting with the denial of funds for the private court-appointed attorney to do the investigation, and uh, culminating in a sentencing order that bears little resemblance to what actually occurred at this penalty phase trial. Um, starting with the denial of funds to investigate the mitigation, I'd like to address the standard of review because normally I agree that uh, that would be an abuse of discretion standard uh, to look at the an order on uh, denying investigation funds. But in this case, we have the, the, the fact that the U.S. Supreme Court has uh, spoken many times on what the prevailing professional norms are in a capital investigation and uh, in this case the the standard of review has to be informed by what the court has said uh, in terms of what the Sixth Amendment requires a private attorney what, to do. What's the particularized need for travel to Oregon and Arkansas in this case in 2023 when um, I think there are sufficient means available for obtaining the information needed by means other than travel. Can you articulate why that was, why that's necessary? Why, you're saying it doesn't, we don't need to be asking why it's an abuse of discretion, but if I'm not asking whether it's an abuse of discretion, what question do you propose I ask? Well, the, the need is, is going to what the Supreme Court requires of these of a, of a, an attorney who is representing um, a capital client. Which Supreme Court case says that uh, a an attorney defending a capital client must travel to visit mitigation experts rather than obtain their sworn affidavits or talk to them on the phone? Which case says that? The case of um, Wiggins versus Smith talks about the ABA guidelines. And the ABA guidelines talk about the uh, standards for a, a defense, and it's not talking about a Cadillac defense, it's talking about a reasonable and necessary defense. And those standards require investigation of witnesses that is a face-to-face -face investigation. Um, and so the travel is necessary, and it's also part of the prevailing norms of what is done in these cases. And that is what all part of what the court discusses in Wiggins versus Smith and in Porter versus McCollum, that there that the the this the the investigation has to um, comport with the prevailing norms. And so if an in this case, even at the um, when the when the mitigation expert was called to testify by the court, she said there were people I couldn't go to see because these people. This is a very sensitive do you investigation. Argue this, do you argue that this wrought a deprivation of counsel in violation of the Sixth Amendment? Yes, that's and that's why there's an element of um, a pure question of law that has to go into the abuse of discretion standard. Just like um, it, the, 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 the discretion has to be informed by the Supreme Court cases that describe what a competent Sixth Amendment investigation would be in a capital case. Seems like a very heavy burden for you to shoulder. 
Well, it's not because, I mean, any time you have, any time you have, I mean, in this case, I think it was, the amount of money that was being asked for was not a lot of money, and the judge was being unreasonable in denying it. Even when the defense attorney said, how about if I just allow some of the other, take some of the money away from the other experts and allow this to occur, I need this mitigation, I need my specialist to go and seek out these people. The judge said, no, I'm not going to have a negotiation about this. So he was really just being unreasonable, and that also goes to the question of him denying the brain scans. We're not talking about a lot of money, but we are talking about the question of whether or not the client had organic brain damage, and the defense attorney had gone and told the judge, I have expert witnesses that have recommended this, and the judge thought that, well, it doesn't matter whatever his problems are, it doesn't matter if he has organic brain damage, that's not something that you need to discern. Well, isn't it true that from, I mean, we also have to ask what prejudice was wrought by this, and isn't it true that Sexton's sister basically established the fact that he had been abused? Isn't that, no one's really disputing that fact in mitigation. So what's the prejudice that ultimately resulted as a result of this decision by the trial court, even if we agree that it was an erroneous decision? Not to allow the travel. Yeah. Okay, well. What prejudice, what was the prejudice that resulted from that, given the stipulation, not stipulation, but more or less, you know, the evidence in the record that the court did have with respect to the very points in mitigation that you're saying you needed to travel in order to establish? Actually, we didn't know what was going to be established, and so it's putting the cart before the horse to say that the defense needs to show what the mitigation is going to turn up, and the defense attorney even made this point, I can be looking for positive mitigation, which the defense case that he put on was about positive mitigation. So it's putting an impossible burden on the defense to say, in this situation, tell us what that investigation would have turned up. I don't know. I think our cases establish pretty clearly that you have to show prejudice. I don't, I mean, I don't know that, are you saying that it is impossible to establish prejudice on facts like these, that we should give up that part of our case law? I'm saying there was prejudice, and it was established, because. So what is the prejudice? What changed as a result of the lack of access to funds for these trips? Because what I hear you saying is, I don't know what the harm was. I can't tell you what the prejudice is, because the prejudice is in the things I don't know. But that won't do under our cases. We do require showing a prejudice, and I don't hear you articulating what the prejudice actually was, in light of what we also know. Well, I mean, I think you're talking about prejudice in a different way than I am, because it's almost like you're saying we need to establish prejudice as if this were a post-conviction proceeding, where we would now tell you what we would have found out if we had the funding. But we can't do that, because until there is a post-conviction proceeding, and somebody goes and makes these trips, and looks into his life, and tries to find these witnesses that she couldn't get on the phone. So we can't do that. So the prejudice is that the mitigation expert wasn't able to talk to some of the people that she wanted to talk to, because she couldn't go and do her job. That's what she is trained for. So obviously, you know, it's not going to be, this is sort of a unique situation, because we're talking about a capital case, where there's a Sixth Amendment right to an investigation that is supposed to be very comprehensive, as I read the U.S. Supreme Court cases. And it is not enough to say there was a rudimentary investigation based on a narrow set of witnesses. So I think the prejudice is that 
we didn't get to do the mitigation that was necessary in a capital case. Um, Would you mind if I redirected you uh, just slightly? Um, sure. Can, can we talk a little bit about whether the trial court truly misunderstood its discretion to impose the death sentence uh, as illuminated by its statement that the sentence was compelled by the law. Can you say a little bit about what evidence you have that the court was truly under a misimpression about the scope of its discretion, as opposed to this being an unfortunate, um, perhaps inartful statement? Um, can, what evidence do you have that the court was actually confused about what it had to decide? I mean, I'm just looking at exactly what she said, and she said this was a, she made it like a mathematical equation. These are the, these are the, uh, the aggravators, these are the mitigators, this, this is the mathematical equation, therefore I am compelled by law. So the, the, uh, I'm just taking her at the words that she used, and that's the last, you know, the last thing in the sentencing order, so I think that to take that a different way would be just pure speculation at this point. So um, I don't, uh, I don't know that she understood that she didn't have, have to. Uh, well, doesn't doesn't the whole existence of this second penalty phase kind of give the lie to that? I mean, it would be a pretty catastrophic misunderstanding of the law to have gone through this process had a penalty phase trial where precisely this issue is being litigated in light of the whole history of this case, and to then sort of conclude at the last minute that this isn't a discretionary exercise. Um, I guess my what I'm struggling with is I, I, I agree that uh, those words are incorrect as a statement of law. I think you're right about that. Um, I'm not quite sure what to do with it in light of all of the other evidence in the record that seems to demonstrate that the court knew that those words were wrong. Um, I'm, that's what I'm struggling with. Well, I don't think the court knew those words were wrong because I think the court did not understand what the, um, you know, what the what the job was, and that what um, in the selection phase that there is the weighing, but then there is there is a determination at the end that has to be an individual moral choice. And to say compelled by law is skirting that. So I think that um, I don't know how to read that any other way than what she said. And um, but that was just something that I thought was a problem in the case. But um, going to the second issue, uh, I think that there is a serious problem where Judge Hansel violated Mr. Sexton's constitutional rights by calling the mitigation expert as a court witness to question her about the evidence that Mr. Sexton elected not to present in his case. And uh, he had been very clear about c wanting to control the presentation of the mitigation, and he meant to ke keep certain things out of the record. And this came up in such a roundabout way because the, the judge initially said she wanted the defense at the beginning of the trial to produce a memo that would go into a sealed place in the record, not for the direct appeal, but just to defeat a future post-conviction motion. So right there, she's acting in a prosecutorial manner, thinking about trying to defeat the post-conviction motion to challenge the death sentence she's going she, to. I'm hit. sorry, who, who did she order? Uh, she, she ordered the trial attorney for Mr. Sexton okay. to prepare a memo of the, of the items that he had discovered in mitigation that Mr. Sexton would not be presenting in his case because, Mr. Se because the defense had uh, put a notice to the court that he was going to be um, using selective mitigation. And so she said, well, I, I, need, I need this memo that the defense attorney is going to prepare. So the defense attorney had prepared the memo. It never actually came into the record because the, uh, 
the judge kept changing what she was asking. And then Mr. Sexton was objecting to this. And at one point he even said that, you know, if I fire my lawyers, can I stop this from happening? And she said no. So then that's what was supposed to happen on the second day. And when the case adjourned on the first day, she was talking about, okay, that's going to happen and prepare to have this memo. But she was going back and forth on whether or not it needed to be put into the record. But when we get to the second day, she says, I've been looking at these cases overnight, and now I think I need this on the record. And then she said, I'm going to have to either have the memo put on the record or I will call the mitigation specialist as the court witness and ask her these questions myself. So this whole procedure, which Mr. Sexton was vociferously objecting to. Let me ask you, if counsel had requested that that go on the record and called and put on whatever a proffer from the mitigation expert, had defense counsel suggested that and the court granted it, would that be a problem? Yes, because the defendant is the person that that would be almost akin to like the McCoy versus Louisiana situation where the court made clear that this is the defendant's right to control what is presented in his case. He has the autonomy, even when he's represented by counsel. So it would be a different claim. It would be maybe a claim of the attorney violating the defendant's rights in that respect. Doesn't our case law sort of send mixed signals to trial judges on that issue? I mean, it seems like we say that, but then we also seem to have, there's this seems like this nebulous obligation on the court to avail itself of whatever it can get its hands on in terms of mitigation and factor that in. I mean, I don't know that we've said sort of bright line that the defendant is 100 percent in control and it would be error for the court to actually go beyond that. I mean, don't we require pre-sentence reports to be prepared regardless of whether the defendant wants it and stuff? I mean, would this be the case for us to sort of make sort of a bright line rule that it's 100 percent up to the defendant and there's nothing beyond that that the court needs to worry about? And that, in fact, it would be error to go beyond that? I read this court's cases as being very clear, and so I don't think it's a nebulous situation because I read this court's cases as saying that this is the defendant's right, the defendant has the autonomy to, and where the judge went off, and I think some of the cases have some language in it, which are the Muhammad cases where you have someone who's unrepresented who doesn't want to have a mitigation hearing at all and says absolutely nothing, I don't want to present anything, and a lot of times they don't want an attorney, which is not the case here. Mr. Sexton wanted an attorney. He just wanted to control the mitigation, and I think it's very clear from this court's cases, the Boyd case, that he had that right. So the confusion was just misreading the Bell case. The judge cites a statement in the Bell case that's talking about the Muhammad situation where the court can appoint independent counsel, but that is not the case when the defendant is exercising his autonomy to choose some mitigation, which here Mr. Sexton was exercising his autonomy to strategically put on positive mitigation to humanize himself, and he was trying not to put on what happened at the first trial, which didn't end well for him. So the judge just completely missed 
misread the court's cases, which I think are very clear. And I think that Mr. Sexton knew his rights under that. He was citing McCoy. He was citing Boyd to the court. And he was saying, I'll just fire my lawyers if they're going to be doing that. So it was the judge who thought that she had to do that in order to protect the case, the death sentence, from a review on post-conviction. And... Okay, you can wrap up and then you can have two minutes for rebuttal. Okay. Well, I just think that there were errors. If you look at the third issue that ended up with a sentencing order that actually is pretty much on the mitigation, exactly word for word, what the first order was in 2013. So this court should reverse this for a new penalty. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Christina Pacheco, and I represent the state of Florida in this case. Turning to the issue, Justice Correale, that you had mentioned regarding the sentencing order in this case, I would agree with the language that the wording was unfortunate and inartful. However, given what the trial court said throughout the proceedings, I think that it is very clear that we can presume that the trial judge knew her role and that she was permitted to sentence the defendant to either a life sentence or death, and that she was not compelled by law to enforce the death sentence in this case. I think that it's more of a semantics issue. She just as well could have said that the facts of this case, I'm compelled by the facts of this case. Was that something that was brought to the court's attention? No, Your Honor, it was not. And there was never any motion filed. There are several issues raised that challenge the sentencing order, and there was never any motion filed or objection made when the sentencing order was read aloud to challenge the wording in the order. This is a situation where the court could have easily corrected these issues, and the trial court was never put on notice. The premise of the preservation of error is that a trial court be given an opportunity to correct such errors before we bring them to the appellate level. So I think that this error could have been easily corrected. This court can find that the judge knew the law and that the statement was just an unfortunate miswording of her obligation in this case and her findings. However, if the court is not persuaded, it's the state's position that contrary to what my colleague, Ms. Kinney, has requested, a resentencing proceeding would not be required. All that would be required would be a remand for a simple reentry of the order. There's no reason for an entirely new resentencing proceeding. The issue regarding the mitigation specialist, I would like to kind of elaborate on what my colleague had described in terms of the sentencing memo and how the judge's rulings evolved. The judge didn't come about having the mitigation specialist testify in a roundabout way, as my colleague had said. She actually did that because defense counsel put on the record, there's two sentencing hearings, I believe they're January 9th of 2023 and January 10th, and you can see kind of how the argument evolves and how the judge changed her ruling at the beginning of that January 10th date because at the end of the January 9th hearing, defense counsels, both counsel, put on the record that they were objecting to the Muhammad line of cases. The cases were unclear in a situation like this where a defendant waives a majority of his mitigation. Defense counsel felt that the case law was unclear, that the ABA standards required more, and that they should be able to present additional mitigation. Now, as this court has said in the Figueroa-Santa Barbara case, that 
when a defendant waives a mitigation, counsel can then has to honor that and then can't present mitigation. And in this case, the judge was in a very sensitive position because we have defense counsel saying, well, we think that we want to put this mitigation on the record. Sexton saying, well, I know my right, and if you do that, then I'm just going to discharge counsel and proceed without them. So the judge was doing what she felt was best in this situation, which was to allow Sexton to close his case. He presented the only mitigation that he wanted to, which was extremely minimal, and the trial judge called the mitigation specialist as a court witness. Now, she told the parties, I could do this one of two ways. I can order a PSI, and then I'll just get all the information that I'm required to look at. She felt that the case law required her to look at all of the mitigation that's out there. And so she said, I can order a PSI, or you have your mitigation specialist here. I can just have the mitigation specialist tell me what additional mitigation there was that wasn't presented, so that way I am going, that way I can consider all of the mitigation in my sentence. Defense counsel never objected to that. They actually said they were okay with their mitigation specialist reading the mitigation that they had because a list had already been formed. And I will give Ms. Kenney the benefit that initially the judge did raise this as a post-conviction issue. Let's put a memo in the record saying what all the mitigation was. I won't even look at it. I'll seal it, and then it will be in the record. However, that evolved given what transpired, what counsel said, defense counsel regarding their concerns about not presenting the mitigation. And what ultimately the judge did was to protect Sexton's rights and to consider all of the mitigation that was in the record. And if we look at really setting aside, and I'm not waiving, I think I made many procedural arguments regarding these claims, but if we just, if we set those aside and look at what Ms. Kenney is essentially asking for, the judge, you know, this was such a heavily, heavily aggravated case. We have the vulnerable victim aggravator. The victim was 94 years old. She lived alone. She trusted the defendant. He was her lawn maintenance provider. She let him into the house. There was no struggle. And we have, so we have the vulnerable victim aggravator. We have HAC. The defendant took her over, struck her at the door when she let her in. A struggle ensued. He broke so many bones in her face, repeatedly blowing, striking her face in such a forceful manner. It was such a gruesome death that there's, her eyes were displaced. So many broken bones. And then on top of that, there were the vaginal tears that support the, during the course of a sexual battery aggravator. So we have this very, very heavily aggravated case. And then the mitigation that Sexton waived. The judge, however, found additional mitigation that he was not asking for and found even with that, that the mitigation pales in comparison to the heavy aggravation. If we take away the additional mitigation that she found that he wasn't asking for, it would be the three statutory mitigators, the no significant criminal history, which she gave moderate weight to, the, I believe it was extreme mental and emotional disturbance, and substantial impairment. If we take those away, then we're only left with one mitigator. And then he asked for additional mitigation regarding his family involvement that was pretty minimal. So I think that this court can be confident in finding that any error, notwithstanding our procedural arguments, but any error here would, there's no reasonable possibility that the error would have changed the ultimate outcome and the judge's imposing death in this case. With regard to the first issue, the funding, I do want to point out that, again, because Sexton waived most of his mitigation, 
he made it very clear that he would not have provide he would not have allowed his counsel to put on the mitigation regarding the the p t scans and any additional mitigation that his family would have testified to regarding what he perceived as negative which would be like abuse from his family sexual abuse he did not want that presented I'll also point out I just justice Coriel I do want to just correct the record and that his sister did not concede during I don't believe she conceded during the resentencing phase that this the about the abuse she had actually testified during the average well she didn't testify she wrote a letter during the original sentencing phase and she explained the abuse that Sexton suffered so it wasn't in the record for the resentencing but counsel knew about this witness it was Sexton sister they knew that he had this history of abuse traveling to go and talk to her would have not it wouldn't have changed the outcome especially given that that Sexton's counsel's told the judge judge Rondolino who is handling the the funding issues that the mitigation specialist had already reached out to these family members and had spoken to them so there was no need for additional funding to be granted for travel I'm not sure I I I fully understand my colleagues argument regarding a switch in the standard regarding the ABA guidelines however I do I think that this court has long held that a that that the defendant must show a particularized need when making such requests and in this case it just wasn't there and I will point out that judge Rondolino actually did grant travel to Texas for Sexton's other sister the medic the attorney defense attorney had said that while the mitigation specialist was able to speak to the sister in Arkansas she wasn't able to make contact with this other sister so judge Rondolino authorized that travel request and granted her the funds to travel to Texas to speak to that sister so there was no showing of need the request was just very bare bones in terms of the the travel and the the brain scans just that this is something that's always done and that's that's just not enough and on top of that I think we can clearly see there's no prejudice given that this line of mitigation was ultimately waived if there are no further questions I would respectfully request that this honorable court affirm Sexton's death sentence in this case thank you thank you I would just say that the the funding motions and the hearings were were held in early 2019 and the case went to trial in January 2023 mr. Sexton informed the court in December of 2022 that he was going to use selected mitigation he never waived his right to have his counsel fully investigate the mitigation in fact he said that he wanted the attorneys to do that and it's impossible to say now what would have turned up if if they in those three years if they'd had the funding to actually do the travel and go and talk to witnesses I I think that that the characterization of the mitigation that was actually put on as very minimal is incorrect there was testimony from his daughter that was very moving testimony about how he had raised his children from infancy until she was taken away from him when she was 11 from a partner that he had built a business with for 10 years from his sister who he was very involved with and who he was consoling through her own problems and grief over her husband's death there was evidence about him working as a journalist about him not having any problem while he'd been in prison and how he had become a very 
a very accomplished uh, painter and artist while he was in prison. So none of this at all was even addressed by the trial judge in the sentencing order. And if you would put the sentencing order from 2013 side by side with the sentencing order from 2023, it's an exact replica of what the judge says the mitigation was. And none of that was presented. She just took and copied and pasted from the 2013 order. So uh, there were a lot of um, procedural errors, and uh, this case uh, should be reversed for a new penalty phase. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're adjourned. All rise.